Thank you for joining. A warm welcome. Uh, today, this webinar will be on understanding multiple sclerosis. Um, there's a lot to take in and a lot to cover, but I'm joined with some um, professionals on the on the call, which is which is excellent. Um, so a warm welcome. So my name is George Hulbert, the sales director here at Yorkshire Care Equipment. Uh, we've been established since 1972 and uh, we're a family run, run business. This is just a few of the staff members here um, on the recent staff photo. So like we say, we've been around for almost 50 years and our mission is to enhance quality of life. So that's what really drives us all to to enhance um, quality of life of those that we, we serve. So we've been specifying and providing uh, care and mobility equipment now for a long time. And we work along with both healthcare professionals and also private um, clients themselves. We've really built up the business on specialist seating. Uh, it's what we refer to as our forte. Um, so we've got a lot of experience over many years as to dealing with such as rise and recline chairs, uh, tilt in space care, care chairs. We have our own in-house physiotherapist as well, which really gives, I think, an added um, dimension and a way that we can serve our, our clients. And um, just really on to touch on the webinars. This is our fifth webinar and um, we've we've run a few before such as on long COVID, on specialist seating, posture management. So feel free to uh, jump onto the resource section of our website and and download and, and share these. We will be making the slides available to everybody that this presentation covers on. So with that, uh, we'll introduce the activity chairs and um, how that relates to multiple sclerosis. Um, really what's so key um, with all equipment really, but particularly this, this equipment is that it promotes really the mobility and keeping independence, which is, which is key. And um, I'll now hand over to, to Chris, Chris Marshall. So he works for a company called Vela. He's based in the UK here. Vela are a Danish company. And um, he will touch on what is exactly multiple sclerosis and how the activity chairs relate to that. So I'll um, hand over to Chris now. So uh, very good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining us here at uh, Yorkshire Care HQ. As George said, uh, my name's Chris Marshall, UK country manager for a company called Vermond Larson, and uh, shorten it down to Vela. And um, as George said, uh, we're a Danish company based in the northern region of Denmark, a lovely place called Orwell. And uh, we were established way, way back in 1935. Um, and we are still a family run business. Um, today, currently, we have just over 130 employees uh, and we are worldwide distribution. So, Vela are the manufacturers of activity chairs, which I've brought for us to have a look here today, and also walking aids, um, with the remit really of promoting independence. Um, and like I said, we have worldwide distribution. A um, little bit of background with regards to Vela. We were one of the first companies in the world, and I will come on to this chair soon, but one of the first companies in the world to use a gas on a chair. Um, going on and further developing this, uh, Mr. Vermin Larson um, started to develop chairs to help and promote independence for individuals with disability. So again, I will come on to that, but we were the pioneers and I'm lucky to own this chair, one of the originals, we were one of the pioneers to promote and develop a chair with a braking system. And I will come on to that with more details very, very shortly. So we're here today, like I'm saying, to talk about MS, 
what it is and things to consider when assessing. So although we are um, talking about MS today, um, obviously MS being a neurological condition, there's lots of crossovers. So when we're talking about MS, we can consider a lot of other neurological conditions such as Parkinson's, et cetera. So I've got a few slides to go through and then I'm gonna hand over to a gentleman called Patrick Burke, a gentleman known, I've known for quite a while. He's living with MS and he's going to go and talk um, about his condition and um, how it affects him on his uh, kind of daily basis. So, the following slide. What is multiple sclerosis? Right, first and foremost, I'm by no means a doctor, um, but I've assessed many, many individuals that are living with MS. So, this is where I've gained quite a bit of my knowledge. So, MS. MS, like I said, it's a neurological condition. This um, is affecting the brain and the spinal cord, which we generally refer to as the central nervous system. Sclerosis. This term, it, it means scarred tissue. And then multiple, meaning more than one place along the nerve. So in MS, what actually happens is the immune system actually attacks itself and it attacks what we call the myelin sheath, which should protect the nerve and facilitate nice, quick activity or new neurological activity. So the way I try to describe it um, to individuals, it's a bit like if you can imagine um, a kettle cord. Okay, within the kettle cord, you've got lots and lots and lots of small wires running directly through. Those wires are protected by a sheath or as we know it, insulation. So if that's all clear and running, then we've got nice neurological um, uh, impulses passing through. So I like to, so if the insulation is nice and smooth, then obviously those impulses will travel. If it's damaged, then we've got effectively a short circuit, very similar to what we see in MS. So on the next slide here, you can see, on the left hand side, we've got effectively what is the normal nerve. So you can see the nice smooth um, myelin sheath. Uh, that's the covering. Then in image two, you can see where it's damaged. Now this is gonna inhibit and stop, slow down or in fact stop those nerve impulses. So this is effectively that short circuit that I mentioned. So that, in, that image on the right hand side, which is the frayed kettle lead, that is very, very similar to what's happening with our nerves through the central nervous system with anybody living with MS. So on the next slide here, on average, there's uh, more, more individuals, more females, uh, the men diagnosed with um, multiple sclerosis. Roughly, um, there are around about 5,000 newly cases each year, so around about 100 cases each year. Now, MS is a lifelong condition, but it's not terminal, and certainly it's not infectious, which I've heard before, so therefore it can't be passed on. Um, on average, individuals are diagnosed very roughly in between the 20s and 30 years old. But however, we do get many younger people and very slightly older people being diagnosed. So roughly, it's estimated here in the UK currently, there's around about 130,000 people living with MS. So some interesting stats there. So going through to the next slide, when we're looking at MS, there's no single cause, but there may be, and it's believed to be several risk factors, which I'll come on to very, very shortly. As I mentioned earlier, MS is an autoimmune disease, meaning that the body attacks itself rather than actually defending itself as it should do. So again, some external factors could affect this, which again, I'll touch briefly on, on the next slide. So, I've seen and I've spent a lot of time assessing individuals with MS and quite often one of the things that they sit down and they stress about is that what did I do to cause or get this MS? Well, the simple answer is that they've done nothing. 
So there's currently no evidence how to avoid MS, but there may be some things that we can look at, and I will do very shortly on the next few slides. So the things that may cause, or what we consider risk factors, we've got, I've concentrated on just a few here. So we've got things like genetics, vitamin D, infection, smoking, and obesity. Well, with regards to genetics, MS isn't directly inherited, but people are, who are related are more likely to develop it. So the chance of a sibling or a child developing it is roughly estimated at about one, two percent, something along those lines. When we consider infections, rather than an infection being an immediate cause, it's believed that the infection is what we call a trigger. So it sets off what we call a train of events. So such things as the Epstein-Barr vi Bar virus, which is responsible for glandular fever. Vitamin D now, this is very interesting. There's lots of research going into this, but it's uh, been, been uh, identified that the further away from the equator you are, the more common MS is. So the theory being sun exposure. So vitamin D, the less vitamin D the body produces, uh, the more likely you are to get MS. So now we're looking at studies to see if vitamin D could actually be used as a preventative measure. So some quite exciting studies going on there. Now, we all know smoking is certainly not a good thing for us. Um, it causes lung damage. Um, and obviously that then is the body attacking itself. So it allows the body to attack itself and um, increases the, the, the risk of uh, developing MS in later life. Now, obesity, um, several studies have shown that the increased risk of developing MS um, is if you're obese, particularly if you're obese um, in your early years, so childhood or early adulthood, um, it suggested anybody with a higher body mass of 30, BMI body mass of 30, actually increases the chances of getting MS, or developing MS, I should say, by around about 41%. So this is a big risk factor that we must bear in mind. So MS, on the next slide, is generally split into three stages. So we have the first stage on the left-hand side here, which is RRMS, relapsing remitting MS. So eight out of every 10 people generally uh, diagnosed with MS are RRMS. So someone with RRMS will have episodes, and you can see them here, um, of relapsing, um, episodes where you get new and worsening symptoms known as the relapses there. These typically worsen over a few days or a few uh, weeks or months, and then they slowly improve over time. Relapses occur without warning and sometimes can be associated with pain or illness, as we spoke about before. Around about half of people with RRMS will develop SPMS, so secondary primary MS, um, within around about 15 to 20 years. Um, so in RRMS, during remissions, all symptoms may disappear or some symptoms may continue and become permanent. However, there is no apparent progression of the disease during the periods of remission. Secondary primary MS, SPMS, the diagram in the centre there, this is a stage of MS which comes after the RRMS for many people. With this type of um, MS, your disability gets steadily worse. You're no longer likely to have relapses, which we can see there. Um, you're, longer, you're, you're, more, you're no longer likely to have relapses, and you can see that with the increased disability over time. PP MS, the last little diagram we have there, affects around 10 to 15% of people diagnosed with MS. It has its name, uh, because from the first or the primary symptoms, it is progressive and you can see that time over disability. In primary progressive MS, early symptoms are often subtle 
So issues with walking, which develop often very slowly, but over time. Whatever symptoms somebody has or experiences, the way they progress can vary um, from person to person and over time. So although in the long term symptoms may get gradually worse, they can be long times of periods when they seem to be staying level or in fact have no changes at all. On the next slide, these are some of the effects that individuals with MS um, will experience. And there's some numbers and figures here. Now, you'll look around the diagram here and we'll, when we're looking and assessing for individuals, we will obviously have the visual effects. So we're looking at the, uh, the walking, the spasms. And then we have the invisible effects. And I'm gonna just touch on some of these because it's um, important to address some things and how you approach them and things to consider when we're addressing somebody with MS. So if I just pop through some of the visible uh, issues on the next slide, like I mentioned, we've got here your balance and walking. These, is, uh, these issues often um, are a result of dizziness or weakness or spasticity and reduced energy levels. So the fatigue effect. So what do we need to consider when we're assessing somebody uh, to prevent the trips and falls in MS? Because this is one of the biggest considerations. So in the home or the workplace, very, very simple things to consider. Removing potential hazards is the key to preventing trips and falls. So removing any clutter, any of those throw rugs, fixing poor lighting, very important, um, and adding supportive features that the guys here at Yorkshire Care have, such as your grab rails um, and handrails for your stairs and doors. Um, one thing I've found when I'm perhaps going to the workplace or indeed seeing individuals at home is that the wooden floors um, and the laminate floors tend to be a lot safer and um, offer, less, 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 offer less friction and therefore reduce the, the chance of trips and floors than something like a carpet, a thick pile carpet. So um, the wooden floors and the laminates actually facilitate the better movement of the Bella chairs through the wheels and obviously work a lot better with walkers and walking frames. So we can come on to that shortly. Wearing sturdy shoes with good traction, very helpful. And I believe the guys here at Yorkshire Care can assist with that. Um, and it may be necessary to look at such aids as a walking cane, a walker, or indeed a scooter, which again, any inquiries, any requests, Yorkshire Care, more than capable to assist with that. Um, one thing that I've often recommended alongside a Bella chair, both at home and in the workplace, because fatigue is one of the contributing factors or one of the tiring things with MS, we need to try and prolong the day for an individual so that they're not exhausted at home, so, sorry, at work, so that we can go and enjoy our family and life activities. So I've often seen an individual, maybe in the return to work scheme, access to work. Um, I've actually seen students in the disabled student allowance forum um, where we may have a suitable Vela chair uh, to support during work and study, but then I've suggested a rise recliner chair, something that the individual can break out and go and literally take half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever it takes, just to recoup the energy and then get back to the tasks at hand. So often a Vela chair and a rise recliner chair go very, very well hand in hand and they seem to complement each other. Some of the invisible things, which is on the next slide, um, some of the invisible things that we need to consider. So again, we can't see the fatigue, but we can see it happening in the individual. We need to reduce the energy levels. We need to consider the reduced energy levels. Pain, which we see here, pain throughout the body. And one thing which is very difficult and obviously something that individuals with MS don't always want to broach is the toileting, the bladder and the bowel considerations. So at home, obviously, do we need toilet razors so we can get on and off the toilet seat? In the workplace, is there an accessible toilet? 
Um, are there lifts so that we're not getting tired throughout the day? Do we need, for example, um, in an educational setting, such as universities, do we need to perhaps leave the lecture theatre maybe a few minutes earlier so that we're not caught up in a busy thoroughfare, just to give time and, and allow that individual to get to a safe area, perhaps on their walker or indeed scooter or walking frame, whatever it may be. So we want to reduce individuals getting tired. So I've had conversations with clients that are often reluctant to apply for jobs or even go to university for fear of the support elements not being there. Um, and that is one of the big things again, and we saw it on the statistic, is that um, fear of isolation and loneliness and depression. So if we can work with employers and we can work with um, um, education, then what we'd like to do is increase and, and improve an individual's life by allowing, by supporting them to enable them to enhance their life, going to work and going to study. There's no reason why MS should stop you. Um, you just need to put the right things in place. So, a few things just to assist is, like we say, the railings. Um, things to help re reduce the stress of opening doors. Very simple things, door handles, turners, um, little extenders. Um, is the bathroom, like I said, nice and accessible. And then that leads me quite nicely onto the Vela chairs. Um, like I say, I've worked with an awful lot of people um, living with MS and I've seen how a very simple solution such as a supportive chair can enhance their life, can in, um, increase their energy levels, which then um, enhances their life when they get back home with their friends and family. So, I'm going to show you some chairs. I just need a quick time check here um, because MS is very big. Fellow chairs, I could talk all day about these, but we want to listen to Patrick and then we've got some Q&As afterwards. So please put them on the forum and then we will add to you um, in the next 10 minutes. But let's look at some Vela chairs. Like I said, Vela, uh, this is a chair developed way back in the 70s. And um, it's the design hasn't really changed a great deal. Um, the, the, uh, the whole purpose of a valid chair is comfort support, stability, and promoting independence, independence, independence. So if I show you my 1970s chair, one of the originals, and this, the 2021 version, there is very, very little difference. Both chairs are sat on four wheels. By having just four wheels, the benefit is that a client can get in nice and close. There's not that trip hazard that you get on a standard chair. Also, the chairs, that's uh, the wheels set in the four corners allow for a walker, a frame, or somebody with a stick to come in nice and close, access, and get into the chair. Once in the chair, then it allows the chair to be walked because we haven't got that trip hazard. But before getting in and before getting out of any of the bell chairs, we encourage the users to put the brake on. Now, we were one of the, the original to design this braking system. So what that does is it gives the user confidence to approach the chair, knowing that the brake is on, it's going to be stable. It's not gonna run away. So we don't have that fear factor of the chair moving. So I'll show you nice and confidently with balance issues, perhaps visual impairment. You can approach the chair and it's sturdy, it is not going to go anywhere. Now, then if I just come down a fraction, if I can then remove the brake, which is currently set up right-handed, there's two little screws at the back. If I wish, I could make that a left-handed brake. So it can be left or right. Should I not be able to reach this braking system, perhaps I've got uh, reduced mobility, arthritis, I can have extension levers on here which we will see on the salsa chair. I can have a T-bar along here. I can have, should it be a visual impairment, or I just need to make that nice and bright, a nice bright um, knob on the top of the brake there. If I can't reach it at all, I haven't got the dexterity strength or mobility, then I can have a little button on the arm, I can have it placed anywhere, or I could indeed 
this accessory have what we call a rocker switch. So I can use either my arm, my elbow, to activate an electric brake. Now currently, the brake is just locking the two back wheels. For 9.9% uh, of, uh, for nine out of uh, 10 of your clients, that's gonna be more su than sufficient. But if we're on an uneven floor, um, a wet surface, or we've got somebody that's approaching from the side and we lean heavily on the chair, then we can actually have a brake that locks all four wheels. But Yorkshire Care and myself, we can assist you with that and make that, um, that choice at that point of assessment. The wheels, large 100 mil casters, and they're rubberized. So if we're in a wet room, shower room, uh, perhaps any spills in a kitchen, then the chair's not going to slip and move away. Now, releasing the brake, and I'm very conscious that, of time, I can walk this chair. So I can get to my chosen destination, whether it be a desk, it could be my dining room um, table. I can um, involve myself with activities, typing, homework, study, work, um, and then release the brake, push away from the table. If I'm in a small environment, small room, um, I haven't got the upper limb strength, dexterity, I can activate a lever on the left hand side on this chair. This allows me to do a quarter turn. So I can exit the chair without having to push the chair back. I can then enter the chair, spin round, it automatically locks in, and I can go back to the task in hand. Now, how does this chair save energy for an individual? I've got lots of case studies, which you can see on the Vela website, vela.eu. There's one individual, Alison, um, she's got MS, and we extended her day with a Vela chair because she could then stand up without stressing, which was very difficult for her. She was very ataxic, so we could, we could put the seat into the correct position to take some of the pressure off the nerves through the back of the leg. We can infinitely adjust the posture, but for that one client, the ability to have the high-low facility meant that she didn't require any assistance from her colleagues, um, or indeed her husband coming to, into work to get her out of a chair into a scooter. She was actually able to do this herself. So the button currently underneath the right arm, again, it could be left or right-handed. If we can't reach those, then we can have adaptations. But from here, I could use the chair, perhaps I could do life skills, I could do my pots, I could use a sit-stand desk in the workplace, but from here I could continue to raise, and this is how we save energy, anybody with MS or any neurological hip replacement, damaged spinal cord, balance issues, we can then exit the chair safely. Come back into the chair, don't fall into the chair, leave it as it is. It's still very stable. I can pop myself in. So we could actually use this now in the home environment, as we have with many of our clients, and we can remain independent and we can open our cupboards. And I've done lots of training with individuals doing life skills again, where we may have been involved in some serious accidents and got some brain injuries to a degree. So we can practice making beans on toast and we could access and we could be a lot more independent. Press the button and that can lower down. Now, if we're in a carer situation, we can actually assist an individual. So yes, we're trying to promote independence, but if we are a carer situation, we can actually have a handheld control to raise, lower the chair. I can hook this onto the back. And then by means of this strolling bar, somebody who's using the chair can either use it as a walking tray, taking teas and coffees, etc., through to another room. You can use it as a walking tray, or you can use it to take the client to the bathroom, into toileting, or indeed through to a shower room or a hoisting scenario. So this is our Vela 510 chair. Very adaptable. We can have whole host of headrests, lateral supports that swing away, thigh guides, split seats, and we can put pressure relieving um, foams, or indeed we can integrate things like a J-cushion or a Rojo onto the seat, depending on the individual's requirements. Should we need some foot support because we're going to high and low um, activities, then 
we can have a nice fold away supporting the book. Now, again, I'm very conscious of time, but I just want to show you this one last chair, the Vela Salsa 400. It's a sit stand chair. It's the one that Patrick has in his kitchen. Now, this means that anybody with balance issues, uh, perhaps amputees above or below me, um, I've done several case studies um, for amputees, but for anybody with MS, and we want to um, extend that day and, and not fatigue as quickly, we can have something like this. And you can maneuver it very easily. It will go very low to get into the fridge or indeed into a work surface, which is a lot lower. Apply the brake and you can raise yourself up to effectively a stuck position and we don't need to require any energy to do so. So that's a very quick whistle stop from myself. The next slide is just a quick case study. Uh, a gentleman called Kenneth and, hello George. And the slide after that one, here we go. This is Kenneth's story. So previously he wouldn't, couldn't um, make his dinner. And obviously that's a big stress and Patrick will come on to that very, very shortly. So if I now hand over to Patrick, Patrick Burke, a gentleman I've known for a long time, um, living with MS, um, I'll hand over now if that's okay. Hello, thank you, Chris. That was absolutely fantastic. Really good talk. Um, I'm Patrick Burke. I've suffered from multiple sclerosis for nearly 50 years. I took medical retirement in 2012, but I officially retired in December last. So I'm 66 and I cannot walk unaided. MS, as we've seen, is a cruel disease and can affect you both physically and mentally. My motto is quite simple. Look forward to new opportunities and resist looking back at what is no longer possible. There is something that makes MS so different from many other physical long-term conditions. Each person is affected differently. Yes, many people with MS have walking problems, but it doesn't end there. It can affect the muscles just on the left-hand side of the body left leg and the left arm, or the right hand side, or even both sides. Now getting on to our hidden disabilities that Chris touched on, when I'm physically tired, my speech becomes even more slurred. I don't notice the problem myself. Also, I recently noticed that it takes me longer to mentally process an event. And my wife asks me questions. She, she can see the wheels going round and round. And my memory is shocking. Age might be a contributory factor, but MS is certainly in the mix. My life is full of challenges. People can see I am physically disabled, but a huge number of problems lie with the disabilities that cannot be seen by other people. They're called invisible disabilities. Let me give you an example. I cannot pick up a piece of paper from the floor, something you don't even think about. For me, there is only one outcome. I fall over. If I get very tired, then I need to sit down and take a power nap. When I go out of the house, I must use a mobility scooter. Shops and steps are a no-go. In my own town, half the shops have steps at the entrance. I can't visit them. Shops with heavy doors are almost totally inaccessible. I want to be independent, but both of these problems remove my independence in one fell swoop. Opening eyes to, vi to visible as well as invisible or hidden disabilities is so important. But remember, there is always a solution. So returning to my MS, medical retirement was a real game changer for me. 
For over, for over 30 years, I worked in the computer business. For the last 15, I was a freelance computer geek working all over the world. And suddenly, in 2012, my life was turned upside down. MS forced me to take medical retirement. I should have seen it coming. Now retired, I have built a quite different life for, my, for myself. Still equally busy, but doing very, very different things. The first thing I did on retirement was set up a website. It's principally for people with advanced MS. I write blogs about myself. It's my website. I'm involved with several universities helping student healthcare professionals understand how different life is with a long-term condition such as multiple sclerosis. Recently, I started a volunteer for a local radio station. Today, at lunchtime, I presented a show. New opportunities, new territory. I'm here because I have become an expert by experience. I never foresaw any of these opportunities when I had to stop working. You just keep looking, never know what's around the corner. Now, I have a very visible disability. I'm unable to walk unaided. In fact, I cannot even stand on my feet for more than a couple of minutes. That's the length of time it takes you to clean your teeth. After that, I have to sit down. In the house, I must use a rollator or a Vela Salsa sit-stand chair. The rollator is essential for walking. Remember, I cannot walk unaided, so the rollator prevents me from falling over. The Vela Salsa sit-stand chair I use so I can run the kitchen at home. I cook supper every night for my wife and myself, and I love baking cakes, not always so successful. But I know the kitchen is a place where I can operate on my own without help. And the chair is essential for me. Outside, I use a three-wheeled mobility scooter that I call the trike. Actually, a travel scooter. You can Google it. It's like a three-wheeled e-scooter. Oh, I love it. I visit the supermarket, do the shopping on my own. I've flown all over the world with it. In England. I take it on trains. It's fabulous. OK, so let's hear a bit about my multiple sclerosis. I'm convinced my MS started as early as 1972 when I was 18. But I was not diagnosed until 1996. Yes, 1996. Long before there were any suitable drugs available. So much has changed since that fateful day in the 90s. My diagnosis was very brutal. The neurologist told me this is an incurable disease and there is nothing that can be done to help me and he will see me in six months time. Exit, end of consultation. I even had to go home and look up multiple sclerosis in the Encyclopedia Britannica. All it really said is that MS is an incurable disease. I suffered no obvious disability, so I could carry on with my job. I was lucky. Since then, the entire world of MS has changed out of all recognition. There are numerous drugs available to slow down the progression. Sadly, nothing to really cure it. During the last 25 years, the internet has been developed and completely changed the way we live our lives. Here we are using the internet to, have a, to meet people. In 1996, when I was diagnosed, mobile phones were the size of bricks, breeze, breeze blocks, not bricks. Everyone used checks, no internet banking. Google was yet to get going, 1998. And Amazon was approaching its first birthday. So there's four things I really want to say to you 
four messages I want you to take away from my chat here and the chat with Chris about MS and the way they like to be looked at, considered, treated. The first one is how it affects people. I am lucky. I'm 66 and have invisible and visible disabilities, but I have my independence. I can cook, I can go out shopping, I can go to theatre, I can travel on trains. Can you imagine being well educated, 40 years old, but seriously disabled by a progressive disease with no cure? Throw in divorce, carers and medical retirement. That is not a rare scenario with people with MS. I know people in that situation, young children. Quite often the woman has a child, husband walks out, she's left with the baby, no energy. That's MS. Personally, quick is not a word that fits my life. How many people say, I'm just going to have a quick shower or I'm just going to nip out to the shops. But whether you have a quick shower or a long shower, you get just as wet. And it takes me a long time to get dried afterwards. But these are two things that you take completely for granted. Quick shower, nip out to the shops. Just to walk from one end of the house to the other, 10, 12 meters on a flat level surface as Chris was describing, can take me more than a minute. Going up and down, up or down, a flight of stairs in the house, that's 13 steps, is a major event for me. I'm not talking about anything difficult, but my life has definitely changed. I get frustrated. Yeah, I really do. But it is, but it is essential that I just get on with my life as best I can. As my multiple sclerosis has advanced over the last few years, my priorities have definitely changed, shifted. I no longer yearn to go out to the pub with friends or see the latest film. I am married and have a family. These days, my activities are very much home-based. Nonetheless, I'm comfortable in my own skin and I'm not classed as a vulnerable person. So things could be worse, but as the MS has progressed, I've had to change my priorities. And that's something that you've got to consider when you meet people, that they maybe need to change their priorities, or maybe they've done that already. A few helpful hints would be a good idea. The last point, I was blissfully ignorant and unaware of the consequences being disabled until 10 years ago. That's 15 years after my diagnosis. I thought only old people used disabled parking spaces. I thought wheelchairs were reserved for people who had been in a car crash. Toilets for disabled people and the need for a walk-in shower only entered my consciousness 10 years ago. Now I need all of those and I'm acutely aware of how important they are. I realize it is vital that the design of items to help people with a disability is inclusive. Disabled people don't want to be labeled as something special in society. I don't like being fobbed off with items that label me as a disabled person. The importance of designing items that blend in with society is starting to be recognized. You look at how adaptable the Bella chair is that Chris was demonstrating. That's great for me. I love my sit stand chair. I can work in the kitchen. I can produce my supper. It gives me my life, my independence. And if I didn't have it, I couldn't do those. So next time you are, you are out and about, Take a look at the equipment that disabled people use, even just the rollator. You can see my rollator in the middle of the picture. It's got a tray, seat I can sit on. It's really good for me, but many just aren't. 
how many items do you see that are clunky, chunky, and made for a price? In my opinion, it is very important to design and make items that truly help disabled people, including those with MS, and make them feel a part of our community. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, this is Patrick. I'm just going to show you some of the features of this chair that I'm using regularly in the kitchen. You can do so much with it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the height, go into the cupboard, get out the saucepan. I'm going to go to the sink, apply the brake, fill it up with some fill the saucepan up with some water, release the brake. And go over to the cooker. Put the saucepan in the cooker. Really is very easy and is very useful. Hello, this is Patrick. I'm just Good. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you, Chris. That was very informative there was a lot covered there a lot to lot to take in um, but as we mentioned we'll um, share the recording share the slides um but i think before we wrap up there's thank you um please keep sending the questions through but there's quite a few questions that have come through here which we'll seek to to answer now so i'll um ask you to unmute chris if that's Okay, I think there's a few coming up for, for you here. Um, question here, there were thoughts that COVID and vitamin D risks might have been present as higher number of BAME communities were affected. Therefore, are they seeing an increased prevalence of MS in these communities? Don't know whether you can, um, might be in the best position, Chris, to... to... No, I, I, I've got to be very honest, it, it's not something I've researched um, during this period, um, but it's a very interesting question, and I, and I think um, if it's okay, maybe I can take some details and look into that, and, and perhaps yeah, sure. come back because I think that's a very good question. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. So if you we'll... could, George, just um, forward that to me. Yeah, that's no problem at all. Um, just scrolling down now, and. Um, Tracy, you asked again, could you make use cost effect shower chair and wheel commodes with four locking wheels in one action rather than individual locking each caster? Well, that, that's an interesting one because to me, the Vela chair is unique um, or pretty unique, I think, in that situation where you've you, you've got the ability, haven't you, Chris, with just a handbrake to to break the casters. I haven't really seen it on any of the, no. you know, basic. No, I haven't seen it on any um, showering equipment um, to date. Um, the alternative options, uh, and I'm using my ergonomics background here, is um, there are chairs out there with brake loaded casters. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, they are what they say on the tin. When you sit on the chair, they break. But the, the, the negative is that you have to stand up to move the chair. So you, you're always in a, a bit of a compromise. But that may be something to look at, the brake loaded casters. And they can be universal. Good, thank you, Chris. Um, another question here, how many hours do you recommend these chairs are designed for people to use? Obviously it would be individually guided, but wondering from a company perspective, what the longest is suggested? Well, they're, they're, they're a grade one medical uh, chair. Um, so if it's in the office environment, use it all day. And, and, and is that the angle that you're looking at how many hours in the day? Uh, because if the individual um, is capable to obviously get in and out the chair and change their seating posture, and obviously the, the adjustments that we have on the chair, so I just, uh, sorry, bear with me, put it on the handheld control, didn't I? If I just lower the chair, um, again, using my background ergonomics, workplace and um, mobility and disability, is we're not designed to sit still. So if we can 
infinitely adjust the chair and keep changing the body, that's going to be beneficial for us. So it's that old adage, dynamics, keep moving, don't, don't sit in the one position all day. So in theory, you sit in it all day. And I do have clients that sit in it all day and then go home and sit in one because they find it comfier and more accessible than a standard sofa, which are often too low, too deep. So I hope that answers that question. As, as long as they are comfortable, use it as long as possible. That really helps, Chris. I think that flexibility in terms of the tilt, the back angle, um, you know, that you, you've, you've got on that chair, it just helps you to distribute your, your weight more evenly over a um, surface or alter the, the pressure points. Of course, if somebody had pressure issues, um, so we can put pressure relieving products, you know, within the seat, it might be just a shorter period uh, that's recommended to, to use. But I think as Chris points out, these are used as um, activity chairs, work chairs, you know, so, so we have clients who use them all day. Uh, Chris, we had a question, what was the first chair called, please? Did you want to just um, briefly touch on the, each model and their names? Just so yeah, people... that, that would be fantastic. So um, for your information, we do seating, um, so from small individuals, pediatrics all the way through to uh, bariatrics, um, so we accommodate anything from four year olds all the way up to um, geriatrics, but then weight wise, we can go up to 44 stone. Um, and we're seeing more and more. Um, this chair here, this is mine. So, <laughs> so you can't have one of this. I found it on an auction site um, and it's one of the original Vellas from way back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, but again, the design hasn't changed. This is the Vela Tango 510. Now, I have the demonstration model, um, and I believe these guys do in-house at Yorkshire Care, and it's the electric version. It does come in a manual gas, but what we find from our sales statistics and what we tend to try to do with our client base is future-proof um, an individual's purchase. So, yes, they may well be able to operate and have the core stability and, and strength to operate a manual chair, but quite often with the neurological conditions, it's degenerative. So we try, and it's, it's not pushing sales, it, it's far from that, we're actually trying to save money, is that future-proof and look for something that's going to be adaptable, adjustable as the individual requires. So like I said earlier, we can add and we can take off these chairs. They're from Denmark, so it's like Lego. So if we wanted to adapt things as the individual generates or their disease progresses, then we can add, like I said, laterals via care cushions, should we get scoliotic, kyphotic. So the adaptability, the Velotype 510. The other chair that we saw here, and this is the one that Patrick demonstrates so wonderfully, is the Vela Salsa 400. Um, and this one here has what we call the S150 back and arms. And generic to all the Vela chairs, they all come with the brain. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Chris. Another question for you here. Do you advise their uh, use in the hospitals? I think you'd be best place to... It's got an order for six chairs, <laughs> I can't, for Bolton actually. Um, and so, as a company, we make rehab chairs, but we also make medical range. So, uh, currently over here at the UK, we've got a big campaign uh, with mammography chairs. So, we're doing an awful lot of chairs. Um, and the, the, the benefit of having the chairs in these units is that we're increasing patient workflow whilst also maintaining um, the individual's safety. And on top of that, we're looking after the staff's staff. So we're actually reducing any work-related upper limb disorders because taking um, a patient, an individual that may be frail or disabled, and quite often with them in a standard office chair to a scanner uh, or indeed into um, a lab scenario, these chairs used by staff, nurse, um, to take patient quickly, safely, reduce upper limb disorders. But once we're at, perhaps for example, a scanning machine in a mammography department, we can actually stand away from the client, place the brake on, put the back in, and ensure that we can raise the chair to get a, a, an optimal scan and the patient is nice and safe. 
we can then speed up the whole process because time is of the essence in the NHS, take them out of that scanner room and bring in the next patient. Um, the other chairs that we're currently doing in the medical world, in the NHS, we're doing lots for ophthalmology and we're doing an awful lot in the dentistry. I mean, so yes, we, we tick a lot of boxes. Good, thank you. A question here from Jody. I work for the local authority and we do not have any funding for seating. Do MS Society help people with this or anyone else who may assist? Yes. Well, I think both um, Chris and I can, I'm sure um, Patrick might even have um, something who can comment on that, but there, there's a huge really selection of charities which will be happy to share um, their listing with you um, who support. Um, patients in that way but Chris you'll have worked a lot with some of these yeah um, and again I do have a little list um, I can't remember if, if it's on the bottom of our uh, Vela MS um, web page um, but I did find a, a probably six seven funding um, avenues that you can go down I think one was called turn to you or turn to us but if you take the individual's details please George uh, I, I can actually send and that information but yes the likes of the ms society and the ms trust quite often can help with funding so yes um but obviously if you're going into a workplace then the individual can apply for what we call is access to work that's a government run um, funding channel um, and you go to your local job center for that um, so if you just google access to work you can then uh, fill out the forms you can then apply for the grants the other route to getting funding is the DSA, so Disabled Student Allowance. So that, again, that covers many, many disabilities, uh, but I have done lots of chairs uh, for that arena and they, they are fully funded. Um, and that funding can, can stretch as far to profiling beds, riser recliners. I've even seen through ceiling hoists uh, and high-low kitchens. So there, there are charitable funds um, out there, certainly. Good, thank you. Another question. I have a client who is due to trial a drug to reduce fatigue. Have others come across this suggestion? I do not have the name of it. Patrick, I don't know whether I could ask you to unmute at this point. Um, comment on that. I have no experience to comment on drugs that help with fatigue. Um, so I can't really say anything outrageously positive about it. Um, I mean, I myself just, I'm very lucky that I can just sit down and take a nap. But as for drugs that are available, I think there is, I don't think there's any that have been authorized by um, NICE for the NHS, but there are a couple around. Um, I can't remember their names off the top of my head. Thank you, Patrick. Chris, I don't know whether you've had any experience with any of your... I, I, I'm not... No, no, certainly not with the drug side of things. George, no. Okay. Again, happy to look into it, research it, or uh, whoever was asking. Yeah, sure. Always, always. And um, Tracy, you were asking in relation to where we're based. So we're based in Harrogate in North Yorkshire, but we really cover... Um, the whole country really over the covid period it's brought the whole country together really made made it a smaller place in terms of being able to sometimes conduct assessments over video um, quite successfully or else we have the um, assessors on the on the road who are able to come out with with these vela chairs and assess your your patients and Chris, maybe one for you. Do these chairs come under Lola for servicing? Uh, no, that's the uh, the lifting, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have to go through any Lola testing with these, apparently. Good. And um, how easy is it to retrofit different seats? You mentioned row hose, etc. Very, very easy indeed. Now, just imagine these like Lego. I, I, I know it's a silly thing, but they are Danish. Um, so the way these things are designed is, for example, um, they do get recycled very well. So if anybody's working within the NHS, um, NRS, Mediquip, uh, those sort of bodies, uh, 
you can often fund these and, and say that they are recyclable as well. So you can you can get them back out into the community if necessary. So one example, this is your standard chair. Uh, Joe Bloggs um, no longer requires it for one reason or another. Goes back into stores and an OT assessors and we need a smaller seat. Well, we can pop a smaller seat on this frame. Very, very simple. I can do it. It's four bolts underneath, drop it on, let that go. With regards to the pressure relieving folks um, and, and, and building these, incorporating those into the seat, then you've, we've got a couple of options. We can um, take a drawing and we can have extra phones put in with the ITs, the, sorry, the issue of tuberosities. We can have coptics, cutouts, etc. We can build things up the sides if required. But if we needed a, a Roho or a, a J cushion, then the option is, if we want it to be nice and discreet, we can send that over to Allwall in Denmark and we can get the chair made and we can have that cover, um, cushion incorporated into the chair and have it covered. Most clients are happy though to have what we call an OC made. So we get it manufactured without the um, fabric or the foam and we go back to the ply board, but then that's Velcroed. And then the reciprocal seat has the opposite Velcro, so we can attach that on there. So I know uh, many of our clients, they use uh, the via care cushions, which we can do also on the backs. So we can accommodate pressure relief, uh, hip discrepancies, uh, and then we can do the same on the backs. And it is as simple as just getting it manufactured without the foams and the fabric. So hopefully that answers that. Thank you, Chris. And then uh, we had a question in terms of cost. Uh, so what do what do they cost? If we start with the sit to Chris will correct me if I'm wrong here, but if we start with the sit to stand chair, so the yep. salsa, uh, we're really starting at around about the eight to nine hundred pound mark. Absolutely on the button there, yeah. And then do you want to take us through the, the next ones, Chris, up to the so larger this one chair? Um, as so we'll take the strolling bar off because I've just put that on for today's demonstration. That would slide out. So again, you can retrofit all of these pieces of equipment. Um, so this, as you see it, without the handheld control, that chair comes with the seat in the back, as you see, the neck rest is included. Should you not want that, then you order it up without. So it comes automatically with. This, with the electric lift, is 2,700 pounds. If you go for the, um, gas operated one, and it's around about the 1500 pound mark. But these chairs all come included, like I said, with the arm, all the back adjustments, the flip back arms, the side transfers and the like. Um, so there's no hidden, hidden costs in there. The things that you pay for on top are your thigh guides, your laterals. If you wanted a more supportive neck, then that's an additional 200 pounds or 250 pounds but that's much more adaptable offers a little bit more support so as you see 2700 the manual around about 1500 and you are exactly right eight nine hundred pound for the salsa that's very helpful chris thanks and just thanks really to the audience for being so interactive there's a lot of comments coming through and um, following the question about the drugs so thank you that's something that we can share with, with everybody um in terms of the another question here do we have anyone in our service that is a specialist or access to pressure seating mats chris do you have any access to pressure mapping i think it goes back to the yeah, um, I, i've seen a few companies doing this um mm. it's not something i do or or vela do as individuals and for everybody's information, Vela, Vela do not sell direct. So it all goes through our partners, so here today, Yorkshire Care. Now, it could be something that Yorkshire Care look at. Uh, I have seen the systems and they work very, very well um, because I know some of, well, my old hat again, going back 20 years ago, it's just a simple map that you place on, get the individual in and it takes the reading and then we can incorporate different phones and things. So. It may be something that you guys at Yorkshire Care look at, but it's not yeah, sure. currently we do. Yeah, no, there's a couple which come to mind of third parties. So maybe I'll reach out to you separately on that one, Tracy, if you've got a particularly um, patient in mind. 
Um, I had a question in terms of cleaning, uh, Chris. How easy to clean? Extremely, yeah. Uh, this this um, currently is one called the mainline fabric, so it's got a wool content in it, just soapy warm water. Uh, that's going to be, do the job. Um, under here, and all the rest of the frame, just wipe it off with a nice um, soft detergent, um, nothing too aggressive. Um, if we have um, incontinence issues, um, as do many individuals with MS, then perhaps we don't want to make it all waterproof. I mean, we can do. We can have it fully in compound fabric, which is hospital grade uh, fabric, so it's fully wiped down, alcohol clean. Um, but one thing I often say for individuals at home is try and keep it as homely looking as possible, you know, it doesn't have to stand out. Um, so you may just have a four way stretch cover, which is uh, an incontinence cover, and we can have those on seats and backs. And I find those perhaps one of the better options in that you can whip it off if you've got guests coming and you don't want to, to show them that you've got that incontinence and then you can pop it on when you're on your own. But, and it means you can wash it and quickly dry it rather than waiting for these to dry off should you have an accident. So yes, very, very easy to wipe out. Good, well that's excellent. Thank you um, very much, Chris, for, for answering those, those questions there. Um, apologies if we've missed any contrasts that we go in a little bit um, over time, but we will be going back through them again and reaching out if we've if we've missed any any questions. So I think just to to round off, um, we've obviously touched on the Q and A there. That's great. So I just want to really point you to our website, the free resources what we've um, got on offer. So more often than not, if we're going back to um, local authority or you work for social services, we've got to justify um, when we put in a case together for somebody to have one of these chairs. Well, we've got some great justification templates online. Um, we've got seating prescription forms, especially seating ebook, lots of training videos. So just really encourage you to dip on there, um, pull off what you need and what will be helpful. We mentioned about the previous webinars that we've run, and I think that'd be interesting as well for you to, to look at. And of course, we're here to to help assist either by email or over the phone. And if you've got any patients who you think it might be interesting to try one of the Vela activity chairs with, we'd be more than happy to, to come out and bring the chairs with us and move from there. So I just wanted to round up with a special thank you really to, to Patrick. Um, that was excellent. Thank you for your um, what you went over. Very enlightening, a lot to take in. Um, I think it'll be helpful for me to, to look back at that and really learn more about the condition. And that was, it's very much appreciated you, you coming on. And thank you too to, to Chris uh, with the chairs and um, running over those in detail and how really it enables somebody with multiple sclerosis to have that independence and um, the enhanced mobility. Contrast, we're a little bit over time, so thank you to everybody for joining. Um, there's our details just there on the on the screen, but we'll we'll close up now and we'll look forward to, to seeing you next time. Thank you.